I'm James McGuire, and our topic today is cloud computing, best practices in the cloud. To talk about that, I'm joined by Charlie Lee, Chief Cloud Officer at Capgemini. Hi, Charlie. How are you doing today? Doing well. Thank you, James. Thank you for having me here. Good, good. I know that you are in, in Atlanta today, correct? That's right. Sunny Atlanta. <laughs> so, so cloud computing, I think there's a certain amount of confusion out there. A lot of businesses want to get on board with public cloud, but certain businesses are still reluctant to give up that in-house data center. They want that private virtualized cloud. Uh, and of course, then there's the hybrid cloud. I mean, what, what, what do you tell clients in terms of balancing public and private cloud? Yeah, that's a great question. We have a term in the public cloud for those folks who still love to have their own data centers. They're called server huggers. <laughs> All this aside, you know, it, it, there really isn't a magic formula to say that you know your enterprise should have twenty percent, you know, public cloud, eighty percent private, or vice versa. Right. Really, what you really think you should think about is certain criteria that makes private or public cloud a viable solution for your enterprise. For example, if you uh, have data sovereignty needs, uh, that may move you to the private cloud. If you right. have very specific uh, classified security needs, uh, US government or, or you know, French government, you may want to consider a private cloud. You may not be allowed to be in the public cloud in that instance. Exactly. Right. Uh, there are certain uh, regulatory and compliance concerns that the public cloud may not be able to address today, even though they're, they're really adding more and more compliance requirements, but some are still not available. You may want to consider private cloud. There may be uh, performance reasons uh, for certain specific workloads like SAP. If you want a very specific set of performance standards and SLAs, which the private, uh, the public uh, cloud providers don't provide, uh, where there are certain limitations. For example, most public cloud providers today only support SAP up to three terabytes. Mm. So if you have a larger installation, you probably want to consider a private installation or private cloud version of uh, SAP. Uh, there are also other reasons, such as uh, I met a customer just recently that said all their applications are so fine-tuned. Their, their data centers are already co-located they're all fully integrated, and the cost to decouple them, move them to the cloud, and then reintegrate them all together, it, it destroys the business case. Right. right. So there are still quite a bit of reasons why you want to go private, but the notion certainly is true that you know if you're not in the business of running a data center, you probably should let experts handle it. Right. I mean, it seems like we're we're very much living in a multi-cloud world in which a lot of businesses have more than one cloud contract going on at a time. Perhaps they're doing they have an infrastructure as a service contract with someone, but they might have a data, they might be doing their database needs with someone else. I mean, do you see that sort of a broken up uh, you know, piecemeal arrangement or not so much? You know, absolutely. I think first of all, we we believe hybrid cloud is the way to go, and mm -hmm. then customers are increasingly moving to that strategy. Uh, the first generation of folks that went public cloud, I think, was very much of a one vendor strategy. They went with all AWS or all Microsoft. Right. And that's slowly changing now. We're seeing a lot of clients looking at different versions of cloud for their different needs. And we also see public cloud vendors starting to distinguish themselves uh, because the infrastructure game is almost over. So they're now adding innovation and services on top of the infrastructure that really distinguish uh, or differentiates them from each, each other. Right. So we start to see clients looking at very specific cloud providers, even niche ones, for specific purposes. I mentioned earlier uh, about SAP. There are vendors that specialize on performance, impre improving the performance of SAP in a private cloud environment. There are cloud providers that are very good at machine learning. So really, it's, it's at a point where clients are starting to have a multi-vendor strategy and using different clouds for different purposes. You know, as, as companies think about selecting a cloud, a, a cloud provider, what sort of advice do you give them in terms of kicking the tires out there? Because I, I think part of the problem is a lot of cloud vendors are not offering an apples to apples comparison. So shopping can be really tough. I mean, what, what, what do you tell folks about that? Yeah, absolutely. There, I think there's a lot of things you need to consider when you consider uh, the criteria for selecting the right vendor. One is your existing assets, right? If you have a ton and ton of Microsoft assets today, there are probably a lot of advantages of going straight to uh, to Azure. Uh, Microsoft may provide certain incentives for you to do so. So that's certainly something that you want to consider. Um, in other cases, there are very specific needs that you have around storage, uh, data, the speed of data, the speed of uh, you know uh, creating a data lake or doing analytics, and you may want to consider you know another vendor who is more suited for that. Uh, some cases, customers are looking only for dev and test. I just want dev and test. I want to drive only pure infrastructure cost. And again, you may want to consider you know, a, a larger volume player for, for that type of workload. So really, there are a lot of different things to consider. You also have to consider, as I mentioned earlier, the integration costs that you may, want to, may, may have to incur. 
you, you also have to think a little bit about vendor lock and you know, are you gonna plan on using every single tool that particular vendor provide, or are you thinking about having some portability, right? Um, you know, a lot of customers are thinking about being able to switch from one cloud to another based on pricing conditions in the future. So if they have that strategy, then obviously the criteria of selecting a vendor would be very different. I think sometimes the, the idea of avoiding vendor lock-in or that the cloud would enable you to avoid vendor lock-in is maybe a bit of a myth and that once you get set up with a certain cloud provider within a certain way, it's going to be pretty hard to switch. Agree or disagree on that? Well, not necessarily. So I don't see that the, the whole event of cloud computing or public cloud providers has changed the way we look at vendor lock-in. You are as vendor locked into an Oracle or IBM as you are now to a cloud provider. That really hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. I think it's a strategy that you have to think about. Vendor locking is not necessarily a bad thing. If everything on your business runs on Microsoft and you want to go to Azure and use Service Fabric and so on and so forth, and you have you get all the advantages, great. But if you your strategy is is a multi-vendor strategy, you have you want to use best of breed solutions and you want to have the ability to uh, be portable uh, down the line. Then obviously you you know you want to you want to set up those strategies to not lock yourself in. But I don't think a particular vendor or a particular uh, you know paradigm uh, really changes the way you look at vendor lock in or not. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense, it, it, it does. Uh, so what about the question of cloud management and specifically the piece about costs? I mean, I think there's there was originally some confusion like oh we're going to save money going to the cloud, but I think that's sort of changed over time. It's actually, it's a competitive edge. It might not be a money-saving edge, a money-saving idea. Uh, what, what do you tell folks about, uh, you know, cloud management and, and costs in particular? James, I'm glad you brought that question up because we get a lot of questions today. We have a lot of clients who are saying that, hey, we this is great. We got our cost savings. It's, it's all so innovative. We're able to innovate so much more. Then we have other clients saying that, hey, you know what? We didn't save a single dollar. It's actually more expensive than before. Mm -hmm. It really comes down to a few things. First, I think there's really poor governance uh, policies uh, around using public cloud. I think most companies had much stricter policies internally uh, uh, before or, or in, com in, in cases where companies that, that did not have good internal policies, those still translates to when they migrate to the cloud. What that means is if you're comparing apples to apples, one minute of server time on a public cloud provider versus one minute of server time on your own on-prem, yours will always be cheaper minute by minute. The efficiencies that where you save money is when you save on the, the scale, the efficiencies, and the multi-tenancy aspect of, of public cloud. And unfortunately, if you don't have a policy that says when you ramp up a server, you're only going to use it for two hours, and then after that, you're supposed to shut it down, and it doesn't shut down, it keeps running and running and running, of course, your cost will end up being more than if you had run that server on your own uh, premises. So I think governance policy is extremely important. Um, the second is having really front-loading that cloud strategy. Don't look at cloud as a one-time, I'm going to migrate some of my applications and I'm done. You re really have to look at it holistically. What do I do with SaaS? What do I do with platform as a service? How am I going to leverage cloud native development down the line? How am I going to integrate all my applications, both on the cloud and on-prem? And then look at the cost holistically to see what your, your overall journey will look like in the next three to five years rather than, hey, in the next six months, I'm going to move 50 applications and hopefully get some infrastructure cost take out. I mean, I think the, the the picture gets even even more complicated when you think about you know moving to the cloud for the sake of certain tools. Like certain vendors have a fantastic edge in data analytics, for example. So you're you're with them and you get that data analytics you know tool that you you couldn't build that in house. So maybe more expensive, but then again, you get access to a competitive tool that you wouldn't have otherwise. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, machine learning is certainly a, a, a huge area today, and and you know, a couple two or three vendors are actually providing very, very, uh, you know, professional level, enterprise level machine learning uh, capabilities. And it's to the point where you don't need a data scientist to actually dabble in machine learning. There are a lot of tools out there uh, for the public cl cloud providers where you can get started as a developer with very little data science knowledge and then be able to make an impact in your, in your uh, applications. And of course, the machine learning piece leads us to Internet of Things, which I think I mean, there, there's a sense that Internet of Things, the competition for the IoT market is going to change the cloud market in that you know, it's kind of a jump ball. I mean, no one, not a, none of the leading cloud providers necessarily have a huge advantage of IoT because that processing is, happens at the edge, not necessarily at the, at the home you know, cloud data center. Uh, what, what, what do you see about IoT and cloud? How are those two going to interface with each other? 
Yeah, I think uh, everyone's struggling to figure out how to really monetize IoT, right? I think a lot of companies that figure out how to actually take the data from the devices, store them cheaply, or aggregate the data in a certain way, or putting them in a data lake. Uh, I think the the future is really to leverage machine learning to really make sense of all that data that you collected. Uh, I think all the technologies in machine learning will help us decide what to do with the data in a better way and help make decisions that a human would not have been able to to uh, garner from the large volumes of unrelated data or seemingly unrelated data to us. And that machine will be able to decipher that data in a better way and help us make better decisions. So I think. In the future, you know, IoT in itself is not as interesting as the decisions that can be rendered by machine learning through all the data aggregation. Mm -hmm. What about the future of cloud? If you put on your crystal ball, uh, you know, look at your crystal ball for a second. What do you think we're going to be talking about in cloud for the next, uh, say, two, three, five years? And in other words, where is cloud headed, and how can businesses be ready for where it's where it's going right now? Sure. I think there are a few things that I think um, is here to stay, right? For those people who still think cloud is a, is a niche, that's already over. Uh, as right. a matter of fact, I think uh, Gartner predicted a trillion dollars of IT spend shift over the next five years, which is, uh, you know, if you're already not convinced, uh, it, it's, it's here to stay. Right. I think uh, the notion of enterprise cloud is probably dead because the, the notion of enterprise cloud was created by some of the traditional vendors to say that these new public cloud or born in the cloud vendors are a niche. They're going to go away. They're not enterprise ready. But I think that the big three, you know, Google, AWS, and Microsoft have more than proven that, you know, their cloud is not just this cheap public cloud. They're, they're all enterprise ready, right? right. So you know, if they're not enterprise ready, that's probably gone. Uh, I think uh, no ops is, is, is huge in the future. I think um, getting to a point where data centers are so automated. I mean, if you ever get a chance to visit some of the data centers that are run by these big public cloud providers, the level of automation is ridiculous, right? The amount of people required to manage the operations versus any typical client's data center is, is uncomparable. I mean, we're talking about 10, 100,000 X difference in the amount of effort. So automation is gonna take, take a huge uh, centerpiece there. Mm -hmm. um, the whole uh, notion of containers, I think will continue to be big. Um, which leads me to, to the prediction that, you know, infrastructure game is over, right? If, if that competition, that cost will continue to go down. You're going right. to have players that can play in that space. A race to the bottom, as they call it. Exactly. The, the next space of, of real competition is really enterprise apps. How do you better serve apps? How do you, um, you know, uh, embrace the serverless architecture of applications? How do you actually uh, run applications in a more efficient way? How do you release applications faster? How do you um, uh, be able to support multitude versions of platform as a service and, and support the the uh, kind of the uh, portability of applications from cloud to cloud? I think it's, it's an applications game now moving moving forward and, and no longer an infrastructure game. Charlie, I think you, you said a lot of good stuff. Is there anything else you want to add before we uh, wrap things up today? No, James, always a pleasure to be uh, talking with you. And, uh, you know, we look forward to uh, working together again. And we think cloud is an immense opportunity for companies. And uh, if they're not already looking into it and, and creating a holistic strategy, they really need to, or they're going to be left behind. Great. Uh, thanks so much for uh, sharing your expertise with us today. All right. Thank you, James. All right.